God uh, calls us to always see the sign and seal both of baptism and the Lord's Supper in light of the preached word. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to hear from God's word. And so if you would take a copy of the scripture and turn to Acts chapter 2. going to read a slightly longer section than what's in your bulletin, just add a few verses. We're going to begin in verse 22 and continue all the way to the end of chapter 2. So Acts 2, verse 22, this is the day of Pentecost, a significant uh, day in the life of the church and in the development of the covenant of grace as God pours out his spirit on his church. And this is the sermon then that Peter preaches in the response of the people. So let's listen carefully again, Acts 2, beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And thus ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. <clears throat> 
So it just so happens by the providence of God that uh, we're in the point in the series where we're supposed to have a sermon on baptism. The same day that we saw that sign and seal applied to little Malachi. God is good in all his ways. And so we have an opportunity to consider what we've seen and what God communicates to us by the sign and what he calls us to is those many of us who have received that sign of baptism. Now, we could easily spend a whole series on baptism. There are so many things that we could talk about. We could focus on who receives baptism. We could focus on the mode. Is it good enough to sprinkle or should we immerse? We could consider the name of God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what it means that that name is applied to us. We could have the kind of sermon where I grapple with one of these questions and present the different views and show their strengths and weaknesses and try to get us to choose one view. Those would all be valid things that we could do as we consider baptism. But here's my goal this morning for us, that you and I might see the graciousness and the kindness of God powerfully on display in this gift of baptism. That we'd see the kindness of God powerfully on display as we consider this gift of baptism. It is a gift, friends. Sinclair Ferguson says of baptism that it's a gift from the Lord Jesus to help us all to live for his glory. It's exactly that. It's a gift from God, an expression of his grace, kindness toward us that calls us to live to his glory. And we see his kindness in a few very clear ways in the sacrament of baptism. We see his kindness in what the gift of baptism represents and applies, which is nothing less than Christ himself and the benefits of the new covenant, every single one of them signed, signified, sealed, and applied to us in the gift of of baptism. It's by the sacrament of baptism and in this sacrament that Christ communicates to us, sinners conceived and born in sin, as we just hopefully confess with our friends. He communicates to us, sinners, our great need and his great provision. He communicates to us in the sign and seal of baptism our sin, which is so great that it deserves an eternity of wrath and the pains of death forever. But it also displays for us the greatness of our Savior and of the salvation that he brings, that by faith in him, you're freed from the penalty of that sin and have in him eternal life and unbroken fellowship with the triune God forever and ever. That's on display in the waters of baptism. In other words, the whole gospel is portrayed to us in this sign and seal. We saw it, didn't we, in the assurance of pardon in Titus 3, verse 5, where it describes to us the gospel in this way. It says, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. I mean, just stop there and understand what he's saying. When Jesus Christ, who is the kindness and love of God, came in human flesh, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness because we could never do enough of them and do them well enough. We could never earn his favor. But he saved us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ. And can't you hear in those words in and underneath and around the sign and seal of baptism that confirms to us everything that Paul tells Titus about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's kind to us and that he communicates to us through baptism the benefits of salvation in Jesus. He's kind to us as well because he communicates to us not just that you've been forgiven of your sins, but in baptism he puts his name on you. He claims the person who's been baptized and says, that child is mine. He claims you as his own. And as he claims you as his own, he gives you both a promise that if you trust in Jesus and know him to be your savior, that everything that is signified and sealed in baptism is yours and can never be taken from you. 
But he also calls us to do that very thing, to respond in faith to the gospel, to confess our sins and to call on Jesus as your savior. So he's kind in the gift of baptism by representing, sealing and applying to us Christ and all his benefits, but he's kind to us as well in that in baptism and as well in the Lord's Supper, he speaks to us, his children, not merely with words, but with what we read in the catechism, sensible signs and seals. He speaks to all of our senses so that we can hear and see and touch, observe. He's communicating to us the greatness of our Savior. Augustine, in writing about the sacraments, describes it in a couple different ways. He says that sacraments are visible signs of invisible realities. The glory of God in Christ who communicates to us by mystical and spiritual and supernatural union with Christ. All the benefits of what it means to be a child of God is communicated to us in signs that we can see. Augustine also said that in the sacraments we have God's word made visible. We see the promise of the gospel that in Jesus you're washed clean, your sins forgiven. And through these sensible signs, he demonstrates to us the truth of the gospel. And in doing so, he's gracious to us. I want us to consider just briefly uh, signs and seals in the history of the covenant of redemption. And we're going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. I just want us to see the grace of God on display in the life of Abraham. So in Genesis 12, God gives to Abraham a promise of seed and land and a promise of blessing. And as Abraham waits for many, many years and doesn't seem to see the promise of seed fulfilled, in chapter 15, God speaks to Abraham in a sign. But notice what happens in those first few verses. That after these things, in other words, what happened in the chapter before, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And notice Abraham's response. Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? Will you fulfill your covenant promises is essentially what he's asking. I have no offspring. No one born in my house is my heir. And then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and showed him, you know this, the heaven and the stars and says, can you even count them? That will be like the number of your descendants. And in verse six, it says, Abram believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So he's heard the promise of God. He's believed, and yet he still struggles. And so in verse 7, Abram says, uh, or God says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And he said, O Lord God, how may I know? I've believed, but how can I know? How can I have assurance to know that these things are true? And then God gives him a sign. God could have said, you know, because I told you. I said it to you again and again, but he gives him a sign. If you remember the sign, he walks through these animals that have been sacrificed. And in essence, he's communicating that if I break the covenant or if you break the covenant, I will give up my body to be broken to confirm to you that these promises are true. What's happening in this passage is... uh, Abraham, this patriarch, this man of faith, says, how can I know? And God says, let me show you. He does the same thing, by the way, in chapter 17, maybe 15 years later, still waiting for that promise to seed. He tries a different way that God hasn't approved and has a son, Ishmael, through another woman. And God says, no, that's not the way. And then he gives him the sign of circumcision. We see God's kindness in the fact that he gives us not just his word, but he gives us signs. Sensible things that we can see and taste and touch so that we can know that his promises are true. Do you need that, friends? Do you sometimes have that question in your mind? How can I know that your promises are true? And what we find in Acts 2 is that God, just like he does for Abraham, does the same thing for us. He says, let me show you.
So let's look now at Acts chapter 2, because just as at various points in redemptive history, God gave his people a sign to answer the question, how can I know? He does the same thing for us in Acts chapter 2. How can I know? And he says, let me show you. So this is the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, as I already mentioned. This is a time of transition, a pivotal moment in the history of the people of God. It's the place where we see the church instituted. It's the culmination of the work of Jesus Christ's ministry on earth. He came in human flesh. He lived a perfect life. He died the death that our sins deserved. He was raised on the third day as confirmation that he had done everything that God required of him to accomplish salvation for his people. He ascended to the right hand, and now he pours out his spirit on the church. And in all of those things, Jesus fulfills the promises of the old covenant. And in response to the outpouring of the Spirit and the gathering of the church, Acts 2 introduces to us two things that will characterize the church for its whole history, the preaching of the Word and the sacrament, as ways in which we respond and hear God's promises confirmed. Both of them, the preaching and the sacrament, point to Christ and draw sinners to the risen Christ for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, for reconciliation and fellowship with God. We're going to look in particular at baptism, but we need to at least understand something of the sermon that Peter preached, and so we'll do that in about two minutes. The sermon that Peter preached. He, first of all, in verse 22, points us to Jesus and tells us that God confirmed him to be the very eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. This Jesus, who is God eternal, the same in substance and being an equal in power and glory to God, became a man. That's what we see in verse 23. This man. So the eternal Son of God took on human flesh, and God delivered him over to you according to his sovereign plan. And what did the people do? They nailed him to the cross. He goes on to say that you did that through godless men, putting the eternal Son of God in human flesh to death. And yet God's plan was never thwarted. God raised him from the dead, and all of this was done according to the Scriptures to fulfill God's plan of salvation established before the foundation of the world. And as the sermon comes to a conclusion, Peter reminds them that that same Jesus, risen from the dead, has ascended and been exalted. He's ruling and reigning. And what you're seeing today is him pouring out his Spirit on his church. This is Peter's summary of the gospel at this great moment in time. And that sermon reaches a rousing conclusion in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain two things, that God made him both Lord and Christ, and that you killed him. And with that, the people of God respond in the right way. The people who hear this message respond in the right way. In verse 37, we're told that when they heard this, they were pierced, they were cut to the heart. Confronted with the holiness and righteousness of God, confronted with their sinful rebellion against that holy and righteous God, they were broken by their evident guilt before a perfectly righteous God. Maybe in reading this passage, we're not cut to the heart in the way that they were but we should be. Maybe we say, well, that crowd at that time, they were culpable. The whole city turned against Jesus, even after he revealed himself to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. Even his disciples scattered as Jesus was crucified. But the scriptures don't let us off that easy. Isaiah 53, verse four, it says, surely our griefs he bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced through, and hear this, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chast chastening for our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. We sing this too in many of our hymns. Here's just one to think about. The hymn, How Deep the Father's Love. Second stanza goes like this. It says, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. 
Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. You see, the message of the gospel shines a bright light on our sin and our guilt, and no one escapes that light. We're all culpable. R.C. Sproul once was describing the apologetic conversations that he would have with unbelievers, and some of them, he said, would go on for quite a long time, but eventually he always asked this question. I think it's a good one. What do you do with your guilt? And he said, as far as he could remember, every time he asked that question, there wasn't really a response. Because everyone knows they're guilty, and they know that the right answer can't possibly be, well, I'm guilty, but I don't feel guilty. But that doesn't really answer the accusations of a righteous judge and an objective guilt before a holy and just God. We know it to be true. We're guilty before a holy and righteous God. And by the way, baptism has something to say here. As a sensible sign of an invisible reality, the water of baptism reminds us that we need to be made clean. We heard it in the baptismal vow that parents take. The very first thing they confess is that they believe that they, along with their children, are conceived and born in sin. Baptism holds before us our guilt. We see it as well in the membership vows. If someone professes their faith and they're baptized, we ask this question, do you confess that because of your sinfulness, you abhor and humble yourself before God? The response of the crowd that hears Peter's sermon should be our response as well as we hear the condemnation that comes against sin is that we are guilty and the question they ask is a good question. What shall we do? You hear echoes in their response of scripture passages all over the Old and New Testaments. You hear Isaiah who confronted with the holiness of God says, woe is me, I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king. You hear it in David's confession in Psalm 51 when he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. You hear it in the confession of Paul even after his conversion, when he calls himself the chief of sinners, when he responds to the gospel promises in Romans 7 and says, O wretched man that I am. But then he asks the question, Who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul When he was confronted with the risen Christ, we're told in Acts 22 that he remembers the question he asked, what shall I do, Lord? And the Philippian jailer, maybe most familiar and similar to what we find here, says, what must I do to be saved? And Peter gives the only answer that satisfies. Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent, And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. If you were here last week, you heard a good, thorough explanation of repentance as a change of mind, a change of disposition that flows from a changed heart. In other words, our repentance doesn't gain or earn. In fact, we wouldn't even know to repent except that God gives us a new heart and that makes us ready to respond, confessing our sins and pleading his mercy. This is how our catechism describes repentance unto life. Sure, Catechism 87. It says, repentance unto life is a saving grace where a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. Let's just consider that briefly as it reflects and answers what Peter is calling them to and what God is calling us to in this passage. First of all, repentance is a saving grace. It's a gift of God through Christ. That new or renewed mind that we're called to is a gift that only comes as God takes hard hearts and makes them soft, as he changes us 
It reflects an answer to the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 51. As he's confronted with his own sin, he cried out to God and said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast or a right spirit in me. Friends, the answer to sin comes not through our own strength or our own actions, but through the work of God in Christ who gives new hearts so that we might respond in faith. That prayer that David prayed in Psalm 51 is a good prayer to pray every day as God continually renews our hearts and our spirits that we would continue to trust in Jesus and continue to follow him in new obedience. But it's the right prayer at the beginning as well. Confronted with sin and asking, what must I do? Is to cry out to God and say, give me a new heart. And friends, it's a prayer that God loves to answer. So it's a saving grace. It goes on to say, whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin. That's what we've already been talking about. But understand what that is saying. It's saying that we understand our sin to be not simply errors, but rebellion against a holy and righteous God. We understand our sin not to be errors, but iniquity and trespasses against the perfect law of God. And it's for that reason that if we're confronted with our sin, we should be cut to the heart because it's, our sin is rebellion against God. But repentance also involves, and praise be to God that it doesn't end with being cut to the heart, it involves an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, the one who came in human flesh, who lived a perfect life, who died the death that our sins deserved. He was raised on the third day as God declared him and vindicated him to be the perfect sacrifice for sins, who has ascended to the right hand and is seated there right now, ever living to make intercession for all those who trust in him. He paid the penalty for sin. He died my death if I'm trusting in him, and he defeated sin, death, and Satan forever for all those who trust in Jesus. And because we understand our sin and his mercy and grace in Jesus, he calls us in to hate our sin and to turn from it to God. And that's repentance. All of it comes by grace. And when we say that, we mean by Christ. And it comes through faith as we're resting in Jesus. Peter goes on to describe what's gained for those who respond in faith and repentance. And in one sense, we could say much more than Peter says. What's gained for those who respond to the call of the gospel in faith and repentance is Christ and all of his benefits, the benefits of the new covenant, as our shorter catechism said. So things like justification, we're made right with God and declared righteous, like sanctification, where he makes us more and more holy, and like adoption, where he calls us his children. But Peter particularly focuses on two benefits of that redemption. The first is forgiveness of sins. Do you see how all of that's leading here? <laughs> that reminder that it's them and it's us who nailed Jesus to the cross, the very pinnacle of the worst kind of rebellion against a holy and righteous God is crying out for forgiveness and freedom and removal of guilt. And that only comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's indeed the great irony and beauty of the gospel. That as Peter speaks to this crowd and says, you crucified the Savior, he reminds them that it's actually through that cross that they have forgiveness of all their sins. So it's forgiveness of sins, again pictured for us in baptism by the washing of water and the gift of the Holy Spirit the life-giving spirit who renews, who unites us to Jesus and all his benefits, who makes real the promises of God, who's with you always, even to the age, if you're trusting in Jesus. The only answer to the problem of sin, as we see it laid out in Scripture and so beautifully portrayed by Peter, is the response of faith and repentance that says, my sin is great, but Jesus is greater than all my sin. And then, as those who've turned from sin and trusted in Jesus, and then receive the sign of the covenant, the sign 
of baptism. Let me say that again. I want to be really clear about this, that what I'm saying is that as those who turn from sin and trust in Christ, then we receive the sign of baptism. And some of you are saying, wait a minute. We're Presbyterians. We baptize babies. And that's true. But understand this, that every Christian believes that a person who was never before baptized but now trusts and follows Jesus should now be baptized. And understand the time in, in which Peter is speaking. No one has yet received New Testament baptism. Not one person has received it at this point. At this pivot point in the history of redemption, this transition from old covenant to new covenant, when the crucified, risen, ascended Christ pours out his spirit, sends out his church, anointed by the spirit and the power of the risen Christ to proclaim the gospel, he gives a new sign that marks out his people. A new sign that claims them as his own, a new sign that welcomes them into the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ and the visible church through which Christ works and saves. Friends, this moment in Acts 2 is a glorious moment in the inauguration of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes in power and glory and calls for a new sign, and by that sign, the greatness of our sin and the infinitely greater work of our Savior is on display, and by that sign, he calls us to respond in faith so that we might know forgiveness of sins and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And as we close, notice then four things that through this gospel proclamation and this new sign of baptism, four things that Christ teaches us about his kingdom and his salvation through the sign of baptism. The first thing that he teaches us in this passage in particular and every time that anyone is baptized is that by faith, repentance, and baptism, you have a new identity. He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It sounds similar to what we hear in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, as we're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In baptism, Christ makes you his own. It's a naming ceremony. He puts his name on your head and he says, you are mine. In Sunday school this morning, we opened by singing, I belong to Jesus. It's a beautiful hymn that expresses our solidarity and our unity with our Savior. I belong to Jesus. I am not my own. In the sign of baptism, Christ puts his name on you and says, you're not your own. You belong to me. And in so doing, he makes a promise that if you trust in him, no one and nothing can snatch you out of his hand. But he also calls you to faith. And it's a daily call every day to remember Christ's name has been put on my head. I will believe him and I will follow him. So in baptism, he gives you a new identity. Secondly, in baptism, he gathers you into a kingdom that is very much like the old covenant kingdom. I want us to understand that it's very much like the old covenant kingdom because it's the same kingdom. And so it shouldn't surprise us when he says in verse 39 that this promise is for you and for your children. That has always been true about the covenant of grace. That's the pattern by which God works in and through his people. He works out salvation in and through families. And he extends his kingdom in and through families. We see that, by the way, in Genesis 1. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And we could add with kingdom followers of God. There's a special place in the kingdom of God for the children of believers. We see that in how Jesus welcomes children. Remember when they bring children to him, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all share this story of when they bring children to him, it's really clear in the passage they're bringing infants to him. They're handing him their smallest child and asking him to hold them. And the disciples think, oh, they're bothering him. He has more important things to do. And what does he say? Of such is the kingdom of God. The promise is for your children is simply carrying on the promise that God made to Abraham, that this promise is 
administered through the sign of circumcision is for you and for your children. It's the same promise that Joshua clinged to and that he responded to by saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's the same promise that we read about in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, when it says, if even one parent is a believer, that child is set apart and holy to God. And it's the same promise, and I don't have time to really open this up, so if you want to talk more about it, we can talk about it later, but it's the same promise that we see in the New Testament where 12 times we see baptisms, and three of them were told that the whole house was baptized. Lydia, the Philippian jailer, Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 16, household baptisms because the promise is for you and for your children. Just two points to think about here. I want to talk to two audiences. First of all, I want to talk to you children. In your baptism, God put his name upon you. And what a glorious privilege it is to be a member of the visible church, to have all the benefits of what it means to be taught the gospel from the beginning. And in your baptism, God calls you not just to enjoy those benefits for a time, but to respond to them in faith. Don't wait. You've seen Malachi baptized this morning, and in that baptism, God is calling you to trust in Jesus as your perfect Savior, not simply because you've been born in a Christian family or had the sign of baptism placed upon your head, but because you're a sinner in need of a Savior. So each of you children, remember your baptism and be reminded that it calls you to respond in faith. But secondly, I want to talk to parents. We heard vows this morning. All of us who've had our children baptized have taken the same or similar vows. And I want to both challenge you, but I also want to encourage you. First of all, that your responsibility as a parent is in part to evangelize your children by teaching them the gospel, by praying with and for them, and by endeavoring to make clear to them that the promises of the covenant are theirs if they trust in Jesus. And so do that with diligence We'll participate with you. And if you need help, come and ask for it. And we'll pray with you and we'll support you in that. But some of you have children who've been baptized who are now far from the Lord. And here's what I want to encourage you with. That even in the sign of baptism, you have a great encouragement. Because the sign of baptism doesn't tell you what you've done. It tells you what God does. And the promises that he makes And it calls you to trust in him, both as your savior and as the one who, as he so desires, can and will save your children. And so pray with confidence and with hope, asking that God would so care for your children by drawing them to himself. There's two more things for us to see as we close. That through baptism, we're gathered into a kingdom that is the same as the old covenant kingdom, but it's growing by leaps and bounds. It says, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. That's Old Testament language from places like Isaiah. This image of God calling not just people of Israel, but Gentiles. Images that we see in Isaiah and Micah when the nations are flooding up the mountain of God to gather in worship to the one true God. And today, by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in and through the church, he's gathering nations to himself. And baptism reminds us of that. The last thing that we see in baptism, or at least that I want us to see today, is this. That when you are covered by those waters, Jesus putting his name upon you, he gathers you into a visible church where he ministers the gospel to you through his people. That's why we read to the end of the chapter. You see in verses 40 and 41 that many who received that word were baptized and they were added to the number. What number? The church. And in the church, as they commit together to the word, to sacraments, to prayer, to fellowship, to the ministry of mercy, and to the love and communion of the saints, they are strengthened in faith to every day believe in Jesus, repent of their sins, and to follow God. And friends, if you've been baptized and joined to the church, that's what this church is for you 
today. We're partners in the ministry of the gospel as we grow up more and more together into the image of our Savior. So let's pursue that with joy. As those who've had the name of God placed upon our heads, let's with joy hear God's word and pray and sing together and enjoy fellowship and hospitality as we build one another up more and more into the image of our Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for this gift of baptism, for the promises that are revealed and displayed through the washing of water that reminds us that it's only through Jesus that we can be washed and cleansed from our sins. And yet, if we trust in Jesus, we are washed and cleansed from our sins. Lord, would you so work faith in each of us that we would all respond to this promise of the gospel revealed in the word and in the sign even today by saying, Jesus is my Savior. I will follow him. We pray in his name. Amen.